So welcome everyone. Also, if you're looking or watching it via Moodle, um, we will be talking about sequence analysis today. Um, so the idea behind sequence analysis is, of course, to um, analyze a sequence, find homology and these kinds of things. Um, so for today, um, I first wanted to show everyone again the evaluation. So if you're a student, um, then you can click on the link on the old presentation in Moodle. It's just a repeat of a slide I showed last week as well. Um, but um, yeah, do fill in the evaluation um, because that helps and it helps people. It helps me. So if you have any comments or questions or remarks about what we should do differently, um, then please fill in the evaluation and I will get an overview. Um, and it's totally anonymous. Um, unless you fill in your name somewhere, but uh, you can do it completely anonymous. So I just get the feedback. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time last time we waited, but um, I think we will we'll just continue. So um, the exam, also a slide from the previous time, um, the exam is registered and it should be in Agnes. I didn't get any mails from anyone that they could not register, so I'm guessing it's there. Um, the big issue here is, is that I cannot look into Agnes. I just have a employee account from the HU and um, if you have an employee account you can't even log into Agnes, which is a little bit of a shame. Um, so yeah, I can't check it if it's really there. Uh, and of course um, you have to register. So register at least two weeks beforehand, but since you never know when they will close it, um, make sure you register as soon as possible. All right, so previous assignments, let's start doing those. So the previous assignments from last time, um, we can do a prediction here, uh, I think. So let me check it out if I can do it. So the name of the prediction is uh, did uh, Danny do his homework. Um, so the outcome is yes or the outcome is no. And I don't know how this works, so I'm just gonna start a prediction. <laughs> That's an interesting fish emoticon. Um, because uh, the question for you guys is did I do my homework or not? Or am I just going to do it on the fly for you guys? So um, let, let's start a prediction about that and see how it works. Um, okay, yeah, I got it. I got it. All right, so there's a prediction started. <laughs> um, so you can, you can, you can click on yes or you can click on no and I think you can kind of put channel points on the answer and then the people who have it correct they um, they can actually win channel points um, so <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see how this works I never used it before so I'm just I'm just curious um, so we'll just wait wait for it a little bit um, of course, this doesn't really help the people that are watching via Moodle. They just want to see the answers to the assignments, but uh, um, we'll we'll see. Uh, I can always cut it out, so that, uh, that's interesting. All right, how does this work? How much time do we have left? All right, so I can see that one person actually voted. So I don't think that it will actually work if only one person votes. <laughs> because of course, then the only thing you can do is kind of lose your points because no one else is there to, to take the points. <laughs> uh, this is so interesting. Like I love all of these Twitch features and every time that I'm streaming, I'm discovering something new. Um, so let, let's see. All right, so predict with channel points. I, I actually can't even see how it looks. Like I'm, I'm watching myself, or at least I'm watching the stream via the dashboard. Um, so I don't count as a viewer myself, but I have some more options, like moderator options. Um, so we'll have to see. I think it doesn't work for mobile devices. 
That's interesting. That's interesting. I can see that you predicted yes actually in front of your uh, in front of your name as a as an additional icon. It's good that you think I do my homework actually uh test this out. I'm I uh, I'm uh, I'm curious about that. I was too late. Hey commando, welcome, welcome, welcome to the stream as well. Um yeah, so you just missed the prediction. I think that I can not Oh, I can choose the prediction outcome, and the prediction outcome was actually no. I didn't do my homework, so I'm I'm sorry for the ten channel points uh, that you that you that you lost. <laughs> well, you predicted yes, which was wrong. So, <laughs> oh man, that's a bummer. Like, well, at least they are for free, right? So you get them by just watching on Twitch. All right, interesting. Okay, so let's continue with uh, with the real lecture and stop doing all of these fancy fancy twitch features um, so um, again um, I need to have um, in this case the uh, notepad plus plus window and this is not the window that I wanted to show you guys um, so I actually didn't do assignment one altogether um, and I did assignment two just like 30 minutes ago um, I, I knew where to find all of the stuff um, and actually I didn't do assignment three either or I did it but not really I just filled in some tips for myself um, but let's just go through the assignments and just answer them one by one and you can tell me the right answer so PubMed right so use PubMed to find all my publications in PubMed uh, remember that I've only been publishing uh, since 2010 um, so let's show you guys the Firefox window uh, I have to find that one and then we just say PubMed um, and it's the first one and so of course if you're just searching PubMed and you're just saying well I want to search for Denny Arons right then of course you get a whole bunch of um, publications which I actually did publish so the first one here is a publication that I did this one, this one, this one, system genetics, and and so on. Um, hey, but of course, if you um, if you go down, then there will be some which I didn't do. Like there's some publications from the 1960s or 70s, I think. Um, and you can see that sometimes stuff is in there double. And like you have, for example, the erratum, um, which is just uh, when we made a mistake in a paper. Where's the erratum? Um, hey, when we made a mistake in a paper, um, you, you publish an erratum which publishes it. Um, but uh, So actually these all look pretty good. I think they, they kind of cleaned up the older ones. Uh, but uh, yeah, these are more or less all of my publications. Uh, you can look at the timeline and indeed like they filtered out the, the older publications. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, so uh, why are there so many false positives? Well, there aren't any more. So question B is there are no false positives. Just searching for my name is good enough. And then uh, the idea was, yeah, you get more wrong. Yeah, of course, because there's more people just called Arons. If you search for D Arons, um, then hey, you get a lot more. Like you get vitamin D and all that. And this is then published by Arons J. Um, but yeah, so um, hey, if you if if you have a very common name, um, like have Chinese authors um, generally have, like and there's a lot of people called Wang um, or Li, um, then of course you get like hundreds and hundreds of false positives and it becomes really hard to figure out who is whom. Um, <laughs> Yeah, 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 like Peter Arendt. So, uh, but yeah, so had the, the, but hey, if you just search for my full name, um, then it, it looks pretty good. So it finds 33 publications, which is slightly less than I really have. Uh, but if you look at the timeline, you see that indeed it, it makes sense um, um, because it only starts at 2010. Um, I do like the new interface actually that they have. The, it looks a lot more like 2000 and something. Um, and the old, the older version was just more or less HTML. So use a more complex query, um, either by using the query builder or the search fields, um, to retrieve only my publication. So of course you can, hey, you can say that I want to have Day Arons be the author, and the publication date has to be, um, uh, and the publication date has to be uh, after uh, 2010. Um, old version what? 1996. 
Well, no, up until like a year ago, the old version was still online. And it looked very like 1995 in a way. So it was just more or less plain HTML, but it, it looks much better now. So if you scroll and then, then it, it scrolls and you have a show more button, it would just used to be like an HTML link uh, to, uh, to the other one. All right, so um, the more complex query, I can show you guys how to do it because you have the query builder somewhere and you could also just say something like author, I think, um, and um, something like this. And then, hey, of course, oh, um, what's going on here? Oh, my keyboard changed to the German one. So let's change the keyboard back. Um, so I had Denny Ahrens and then something like this as an author um, should, ah, it received zero entries. So text availability, publication date, custom range, additional filters. So why is it not called author anymore? Let me see, article type, species, language, sex, subject, age. Huh, interesting. Interesting. Well, yeah, maybe capitals. Might be, might be something like that. No, I, I don't know. You have the user guide, so you can you can look it up. Um, but uh, it's not that important, right? In the end, like um, the search itself was pretty good. It used to be worse. Um, so if you would just search for Day Arons or Denny Arons, it would come up with some other some other Denny Arons who published in the 60s and in the 70s. Um, so, but it's good. So they they actually changed it a little bit, and I like the new look much more. Um, so this is also very new, um, looks very, very slick in a way. All right, so the next one is from Uniprot. Um, so let's go to Uniprot KB. Let me just copy paste this. And of course you can just click on the first link that comes up. Um, so this is Uniprot. Um, so um, had the first question was, find the names of supported query fields from Uniprot help. Right, because um, this is a big database, contains a lot of protein data. Um, so you can go to the help, right? And then when you go to the help, you have here the getting started text search button. And then you can also search here for the query fields, right? So the query fields gives you the ability to say, well, I want to have a certain accession number. Um, I want the um, head, the obsolete entries to be shown or not. Um, here it's called author with small letters. Um, and hey, you have like citations that you can search for. And so you have all of these uh, different possibilities to kind of filter down your list um, so that you don't get too much things. Um, so the second question was, how many reviewed protein entries exist presently in Uniprot for chicken? All right, so this is one that I actually did do because I did it, did it like very, um, very recently, like half an hour ago. Um, so when you when you want to search for things like uh, chicken, so of course you have to make sure that you search in Uniprot. Um, so the query here would be saying that, well, I want to have reviewed being yes, because I want to have the only the entries which are reviewed and which are um, manually validated. And then um, you want to search for organism 903, and 9031. Um, how do you find the organism? Well, you can just search for chicken, right? Um, so if you would just search for chicken, then you get here the organism being Gallus Gallus chicken. Um, you can click on it and then it will tell you the taxonomy identifier. Um, hey, you can also use the, the word C-H-I-C-K, um, so chick. Um, but it's better to just use the taxonomic identifier. So that's why when I when I would search for something like this, I would just say, well, give me all of the reviewed entries from this organism. Um, and you can click enter and then it will give you a long list. And you can see here that there are 2,296 proteins um, validated um, in Uniprot. So they are manually curated um, and they are from chicken. Um, I made a little mistake before and instead of using um, organism, uh, let me see what I used before and I found that interesting because the query fields actually, um, they put in a new one um, and I used that first and it was the host. So the host actually is just a way of, of filtering all the viruses that are infecting a certain host, uh, which I thought was very interesting that you could just um, Hey, instead of having to filter for the virus type or these kinds of things, um, they, they have just a, um, an option to search for the host. 
Um, so uh, just which viruses are able to infect chickens and have, have protein validated in Uniprot. Um, so you could do that using the host. But in this case you need to use the organism to retrieve all of the proteins actually produced by certain organisms. Um, so the next question is how many of them have been created since um, the first of uh, 0109 2011. Um, so um, again you can look into the uh, into the list that we found before, so the query fields, and then it shows that the query needs to be um, that you have to specify and create it, and then two star. So we are uh, writing down 2011.0901 to today, and we can just click search, um, and this will then, um, yeah, so that will just search, and now you see that there's only like 86 entries which have been added. So most of the entries which are in there are relatively old um, because they are from before 2011. Um, so do with it what you want, but at least it allows you to search for like new stuff um, and things which have been updated in the database recently. Um, so, all right, next question. Review the, uh, retrieve the reviewed entry of cattle myostatin. What is the alternative name? What is the accession number? All right, so. Um, the query that I built was this one, so I'm just saying give me myostatin, reviewed yes, and organism 9913, um, which in this case is cow. Um, cows are Bostaurus, so you can just search for Bostaurus and then it will tell you again the organism identifier. Um, so when I search for this, it actually comes up with three different genes, um, and why it comes up with statin and with the immunoglobin here, I don't know exactly, um, but the thing that we are looking at, uh, at is the, the myostatin, right? So MSTN is the official gene symbol, um, and if you would click on it here, um, then it would say that, well, it's the protein is called growth slash different, uh, differentiation factor 8, um, had the gene is called MSTN, it is in Bostaurus, and it will tell you shortly down that it, the, the alternative name is myostatin for the protein names. So the question is, what is the alternative name? So the alternative name of myostatin is growth slash differentiation factor eight. Um, and what is the accession number? So the accession number in this case is 018836. So that is the number that brings you directly to this protein. Um, what are the gene names of this protein? Um, which is very similar, so the gene names in this case are MSTN, um, it is also called GDF8, and some people are calling it MH. So that's one of these things which is still from the old days um, when people would just work on a gene for a long time and have their own name for a certain protein or for, an, or for a gene. Um, so in the literature, these three names are used interchangeably for myostatin. Uh, of course, in like, recent years people kind of standardized on the name and um, are not using the synonyms anymore. So it's it's not advised to continue using the synonyms. Although the official name of the gene is growth slash differentiation factor 8, uh, the gene name is actually MSTN, right? So myostatin. Um, so it is deprecated or it's, it's not advised to use the kind of synonyms anymore. All right, to which ensemble identifier can the bovine myostatin gene be mapped? So um, we are looking just for the ensemble gene ID or the ensemble transcript ID. Um, so if we scroll down a little bit, we see here that the ensemble gene ID is uh, ENSBTAG 00001180, and that is of course the gene ID. Of course the gene ID, since genes can produce multiple proteins, might not be good enough to identify exactly which protein they are looking for. Um, so if you scroll down a little bit, um, then you see here that there's the protein identifier in the string database. So the string database is the database which has all of these interactions to other proteins. Um, and here you see that this is the ensemble protein identifier. And if you actually go down, then here in the poly, uh, polygenomic database, it also li lists the transcript. Right, so if the myostatin gene happens to make like six different transcripts, and then of course these are six different proteins, um, they will all be named or they will all be available under the same name. Um, but hey, of course you have to make sure that if you are working on a certain transcript, that the transcript that you are looking for is the transcript that 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 is there. 
All right, so then the next one was to display this entry in raw text format. So if we scroll all the way up, then here we have format on the top, and then here we can just go to text format, and then you see that um, it, it kind of flattens all of the data and the information on the page. Um, and of course, it has all of these like lines in front, like these two letter codes, and these two letter codes are telling um, the computer or it can be used by a computer to figure out what is on each line. Um, so what might be on a line is, for example, something like ID. So ID, of course, means this is the identifier of the gene. So the identifier of the gene is GDF8 bovine. It is a review gene and it is 375 amino acids long. And then we go to the next line, which is the uh, AC identifier. So the AC identifier is like a list of external um, external identifiers for this gene. So of course the, the first one is the one from the current database, um, but you can see that it's also um, in the same database under different names. Um, and being under different names probably means that these things are probably uh, different splice variants of the original gene, right? Like I told you, a gene has multiple proteins, so it could be that there's multiple proteins there. Um, then we have the DT identifier, which is the, the date at which it was added or updated. Um, so you can see that it was originally um, posted on my birthday in 1998. Um, that's actually why I took this gene, because the sequence was discovered on my birthday. And it's a really, really important gene, um, because it's this gene which produces double muscling. Um, so if you knock out the myostatin gene, um, there is no break on, on um, muscle growth. Um, so had things like uh, Tessel sheep or uh, Belgian blue cattle, um, they have this double muscled phenotype, so they, they have uncontrollable growth of their muscles, um, making them interesting for breeding purposes um, because of course muscle is, is very tasty so um, it, it's a good or it's a it's a good phenotype of course you can go through all of these like well, what does the OS mean well the OS is the uh, description of the it's the, the original species name so in this case Bos Taurus um, then you have the DR entries which are further down and the DR entries are more or less free entries where people can more or less write down but they, they generally point to all kinds of external databases and annotation to the gene and then you have the FT ones and the FTs is more or less how the gene looks and what how the gene is built, right? So you see that there's a signal peptide, and so the first 18 amino acids of myostatin code for the signal peptide, meaning that it is transported to a very specific location in the cell. Um, then you have a propeptide, then you have a certain chain, um, and then you have a site, which is a cleavage site, then you have, so it just, so the, the FT identifiers are nothing more than just a description how um, or coupling the amino acid sequence to certain functional sites of the protein. All right, so then we go back. Next question, so to H was to blast the myostatin gene um, uh, against the Uniprot database. And so we just have a button here called blast, so I can just click it and I can just say go and go. And then it will start uh, a blast search for all proteins in the database, which are similar uh, to this one, um, which would probably allow you to in, in, infer some kind of evolutionary relationship between different genes. So, um, of course, hey, when you do the, if you go to blast and then click the advanced, you have the option to more or less set all of the different um, different. Uh, parameters. And so why we are we using the BLOSOM62 matrix? Uh, we will talk about that in the lecture today. Um, have why BLOSOM matrices are used when you want to compare proteins together um, and compare to other matrices, for example, for DNA. Um, this will take a little bit of time. So I actually should have saved the previous BLAST search that I did so that I could show you the answers. But those were the Uniprot. So we'll just keep this running and wait until we get it. All right, so then the next was uh, the next assignment, assignment three was um, all based on Biomart. And of course we first needed to install Biomart. So I hope everyone was able to um, load or install the Biomart library from online. Um, it sometimes has some issues, especially if you're like using an older version of R um, because um, the script is outdated. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's for the older. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I know, I know. So because you now have to first install this bio bio C manager, um, and it tells you on the website. I think it still works though. It it should actually. Um, let me see if it still works. No, 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 no. So it actually tells you that you have to use the manager to install. But at least that's fine. So and they they recently changed that. This is a change which was done when they launched R 4.0, um, and so in the older versions like 3.6 and 3.7, you were still able to just have this two liner to install it. Um, but yeah, for R 4.0, um, you you have to do it like this. Um, so yeah, it started from 3.5 or greater. All right, so you can install it like this. Um, let me show you guys my R window, and then of course we can have the Firefox window um, when the blast search finishes. Of course, it's the, the results are not that surprising. Hey, of course, this gene, which is in Bos taurus, is very much related to another couple of Bos species. And so all cows, like, uh, um, like the cows which are from India, and you have some other cow species which are well, not really cows, but they look like cows, so they are called boss as well. And of course, these have a very big overlap to each other. All right, so let me get my answers here. So, and the first question was, so 3A was connect to ensemble. So, um, of course, we can just load the library Biomart. Um, I have it already installed, so I don't have to... Uh, do that, and I'm really hoping that Biomart will work. Um, because I have been having some issues last week and it just gives me failure to connect errors and um, sometimes it switches to um, different mirrors so yeah so the ensemble side is not responding and then it tries like the Asian mirror um, the one in the US and if all of them are down then we'll just have to keep it like it is um, but it's been an issue with Biomart the last couple of weeks actually. I don't know exactly why that is because it used to be one of these services which was really responsive and really used a lot um, but it seems that in the last couple of weeks they have been having some issues with their hosting or these kinds of things um, but yeah it doesn't doesn't seem to work at all it, it's not able to switch to mirrors which is just a, a, a shame because it's such a nice tool, especially for R. If you want to annotate genes, it's kind of the easiest way to do it. Um, and if it doesn't work, I, I can't, of course, not show you how it's done. But I will put the on script online um, so that you guys can just run the script and hope that it works for you guys. Um, and it, it should, but because it's just busy. Um, but there might be some server issues there. All right, so this is not going to work. So I'm just going to leave that there. All right, let's go back to Firefox quickly because the blast search did finish. Um, hey, so um, let me zoom out a little bit. And so you see here that the um, that it's 100% identical to, of course, Bos Indicus, um, Bos Cauran, uh, Caurus, and Bos Taurus, which is logical, and then also to Bos Mutus. So these are, of course, all um, cow species. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, and then you see that it's indeed similar to all of these other. Um, but then you see, for example, here, um, Suscrofa. Yeah, so here we see that the, the, the myostatin gene, which is found in cattle, is also found with a 95% identity in uh, things like um, um, pigs. Um, we also have the Taurotragus derbianus. I have no idea what that is, um, but um, yeah, so it's the giant eland. So it's a giant elk, kind of. So uh, you can you can find relationships and see how different species are related to each other based on a single protein uh, when you use BLAST. Uh, so normally uh, you would have your phylogenetic tree of life, uh, which is built up from like a consensus tree when you look at like hundreds and hundreds of these proteins uh, to build up an, an, a way how every species on Earth are related to each other. Um, and of course we normally take like a 95% cutoff. Uh, so you see that it's also um, elephant and um, some some other species, even the lynx. Um, but this gene is very well preserved. Um, hey, even in cats, um, the, the gene is not that much different than the gene is in, uh, in cattle. All right, so those were the, um, the assignments. And 
let me switch back to PowerPoint. All right, so I have to get my PowerPoint window myself. So those were the solutions. The Biomart stuff I will put online so you can run it. Um, probably have to do it later. Look, early in the morning would probably be the best um, because later in the evening the Americans start using it, so then it's even more busy. Um, and, and if you use it early in the morning, then you're only bothered by the Chinese and Indians using uh, Biomart. All right, so the overview for today, what are we going to talk about today? Today we're going to talk about genome annotation, right? Because we're doing sequence analysis and sequence analysis means that um, we have a, a genome sequence or we are we are going to produce a genome sequence and then we want to annotate this genome sequence. So where are the genes located? Uh, where are things like microRNAs, tRNAs? And of course, all of this is done using the homology trick. So I will tell you what the homology trick is and um, I will show you how that is used. Of course when you talk about sequence analysis you also have to talk about sequence alignments um, and sequence alignments um, are more or less the core of bioinformatics. So when we when bioinformatics started uh, the reason why bioinformatics started was because people were looking at sequences and, and they were generating sequences in the lab and they needed to do something with these sequences and of course the first thing that you do when you have multiple sequences is look to see if there's an overlap so if sequences are similar in a certain way um, and of course hey we can do pairwise alignment so you have two sequences and you want to kind of find the best match between them. Um, we have things like multiple sequence alignments and we have structural alignments um, in which you don't really use the sequence but you use more or less the structure, so the 3D structure that is produced by the sequence. Um, since we're talking about sequence and sequence um, analysis I also want to talk about DNA motifs um, because they are a very useful tool um, to scan for things like transcription factor binding sites or um, uh, micro or mRNA uh, or microRNA binding sites in the genome um, and head generally uh, the matching is not a hundred percent exact right proteins when they bind the DNA um, if if they bind like a six or seven base pair sequence, if that is their recognition sequence, then of course, if one of these six or seven base pairs is different, then it still recognizes this sequence. And DNA motifs gives you uh, is a is a computational way of storing these um, kind of uncertainties about well, sometimes there's an A here, sometimes there's a C here, and then you can use these DNA motifs to predict where proteins will bind. Um, and then in the end, I wanted to say like. I have like two or three slides about genome assembly um, using whole genome sequencing um, and this is more or less about how do we now do de novo assembly um, when we have no genome sequence available to test against. All right, so the genome annotation and the homology trick is actually very very easy because we just infer the function from a homologous sequence with a known function. So we have a lot of sequences in a database, right? Here we can use Uniprot or some other database which has like uh, protein sequences or a database like Ensemble which has DNA sequences. Um, and hey, if we know um, the sequence or if we know the homology of one sequence, so if we know what one sequence does, we can then infer or more or less assume that all of the sequences which are very similar do more or less the same thing. Right? So if you have for example S2, we know what the sequence um, for hemoglobin is and we know what the sequence is for uh, tyrosine kinase for example in humans and when we sequence a new species and then of course what we will do is we will take the, the predicted protein sequences and then of course match them to the closest sequence hit, like using BLAST and then of course when we find a good hit and then we are saying that okay so hey, I now have this predicted protein in my species where I created a new genome sequence and this protein is probably going to be something like hemoglobin or it is something like actin and this works of course because many species are very very closely related and the relatedness is, is in kind of this tree. And so why does this work? So the, the reason why this works is explained by Charles Darwin already in 1859 and he explained that hey, when you have sequences and the illustration is actually done uh, by Charles Darwin hey, when you have sequences um, then hey, species are related to each other and these relatedness they, they share, right? All birds have wings hey, so if you see a species which has wings hey, then there's a big chance that it's a bird, 
Uh, of course, this is not always true. There are other species which have wings, like um, bats, um, and they are not birds, but they are mammals. Uh, but in general, if you see an animal which has which has wings, um, then 99% out of the time this will be a bird. Um, and, and that's just the way that these things work. And this homology trick works because there is one common ancestor from which all life more or less started. Um, and if you would look at the different domains like uh, plants or animals, um, and then these domains also generally have one founder uh, which kind of sprang forth the entire domain and meaning that at a certain point they were all similar. And of course these, these sequences, they, they drift apart and they, and they the sequences change but in the end, like um, a hemoglobin sequence doesn't change into a ubiquitin sequence, right? It, it's these are individual sequences. So and the homology trick works because we have a common ancestor. Yeah, so um, sequences are of course changed during the course of evolution, things like mutations, insertions and deletions um, have what we already talked a lot about these in, in the context of DNA. Um, and then we have things like chromosomal rearrangements. And chromosomal rearrangements are bigger changes which occur during the course of evolution and that is for example a duplication. Um, yeah, so a duplication means that a part of the of a chromosome or a whole chromosome is duplicated um, and this duplication is then transferred into the children and is stable. Um, yeah, so duplication occurs a lot and genes tend to be duplicated during the course of evolution. Um, not only that, but we have things like inversions. Yeah, so it sometimes happens that a gene uh, which is located on the positive strand um, is actually when it when the DNA is copied, you have a, a double stranded break twice and then the part in the middle is just wrongly inserted. So it, it's inverted um, and of course this creates all kinds of incompatible problems and is one of the reasons or is probably one of these reasons why speciations occur and because of course if you have chromosome 2 and half of your chromosome 2 turns around and then of course you are unable to mate with people who do not have that inversion anymore. Besides that we have translocation, so translocation means that a gene moves from one chromosome to another um, and this also happens not very frequently but it does happen and of course here and because like DNA uh, multiply or if, if you if you look at DNA, then when DNA um, gets, um, if you have a sperm and an egg cell, and then of course these these have to be homologous for um, chromosomal pairing to occur. Um, and so things like duplications, inversions, and translocations um, can result in infertility. And so it means that you you cannot breed with your species where you came from anymore. Um, and this is not really the case for things like mutations, insertions and deletions because they are really small. And so you have very small deletions, very small insertions. You also have bigger deletions, but in general these don't really break the homology between chromosomes. And things like duplications, inversions and translocations does. And so the correspondence between homologous sequences is of course not exact. So that is why a lot a lot of time was spent in the early days of bioinformatics to find a method that can do inexact uh, pattern matching uh, between sequences. And so, and in the end, this became pairwise sequence alignment. So, inexact pattern matching, of course, for a computer, inexact pattern matching is relatively hard. Um, a computer is very good at determining. Uh, if two things are the same, right? If you have two strings um, which contain the exact same word, and then a computer can just quickly match these things together. But if one or two letters in these words are different from each other, and then the computer has to com calculate like a distance score, and then based on this distance score, it needs to decide if these two things are equal or if they are not equal. Um, and that is, of course, one of these active fields of research still. And so when we look at pairwise alignment, we have, for example, a gene sequence of interest and we have a gene sequence with a known function. And so I just wrote down uh, uh, two sequences here. And now the question to you guys is, what is the similarity between those two sequences? If, if, the, 
if there is a similar similarity between the sequences, and then we assume that is our more or less starting hypothesis using the, uh, the, the homology trick. And so that is the hypothesis is that there is a similar function of this protein, which is being made by this DNA. And of course, for humans, it's relatively easy to just look at a sequence and say, well, these things look relatively similar. Um, but for a computer, this is really, really hard. So this is a really, it's, it's, it's not a, well, it's a more or less solved question, um, but it's still a question where hey, you have an active field of research and you can still contribute to this field by making the algorithms um, go faster. Um, because hey, it's, it's not a, well, the, the idea of matching two sequences together is more or less solved, but the, the computational part, of course, can always be done uh, more optimal. And so this is the idea, or this is what we want to know in the case of pairwise alignment. So does anyone in chat have an idea already if these two sequences are similar or if they are not similar? It depends on the perimeter of similarity. Yeah, yeah, but that's th that's the thing, right? That's that's the hard part. Like how similar is similar and how dissimilar is not. Hey, so they're not this now, they're not the same length, of course, but that's because hey, sequences change, hey, there's little point mutations changing individual base pairs. Hey, you have like little insertions and deletions, which might not be. Hey, but if you just um, with human eyes look at this sequence, hey, then you would say that there's probably something similar. Right, because they all end with A T T T A C A T C, right? Yeah. So, but for you as a human, this is relatively easy to determine, to to see and look if two things are similar. But for a computer, this is a very very hard task, and because a computer only works with ones and zeros in in, in internally, and so it can do. It can say, well, a zero is equal to a zero, and a one is equal to a one. But when you give it these these strings of characters then for a computer it becomes relatively hard to figure out if two things are similar with a certain similarity threshold. All right, so um, the computer could compare the single letters. Yes, it can compare the single letters, but if you have a, an insertion, right? So if, if one sequence is one longer than the other one, then how does the computer deal with it? Um, do you allow it to introduce gaps? And if you allow it to introduce gaps, where should it introduce gaps? And should it uh, optimize the number of matches or should it select against the number of mismatches, right? So there's there's a lot to think about uh, when you are designing these kinds of algorithms. Had the, the, the thing is, for example, do we force these things to be, had the ending and the beginning, um, do we force them to be equal um, before we start matching? And so computers can indeed compare every single letter, um, but there can be a shift, right? If you have one sequence and you just move them all by one, and then of course the similarity is not the same, but the computer cannot simply match them one by one. And so there has to be an, an algorithm for this and to kind of figure out how you can figure out what the similarity is. And of course in DNA, um, you have to remember that there is a difference between transversions and translations. So changing an, an A to a T is much more common than changing an A to a G. So if you see an A to T mismatch, then this is a relatively weaker mismatch than an AG mismatch um, because of the way that DNA works. Um, and the same thing holds for proteins. So AI would help with this problem? Well, probably not so much. Um, in a way it can, in a way it can't. Um, hey, if, you, if you think about um, AI, then hey, you generally think about self-learning algorithms. Hey, but in this case, we are the deciders, right? We as humans are very good at pattern matching. Hey, if you just um, think about these little games, which you used to have in like these little books where you would have like a square filled with letters and then you had words which were inside of this square with letters and you had to find them, right? Humans are very, very good at that. You can, you can look for, you can look at the word and then you just scan through the matrix and then you, you find these words because our, our eyes and our brains and all of our, the way that we are built is we are built for pattern matching. We are built to recognize faces from, from other humans. And that's why people see um, their toast, right? And they look at their toast and they see a photo of their favorite rock star on there. Then they make a photo of it, they post it online, and like 90% of people are thinking like, well, I don't see anything in this toast. But 
people are very good at recognizing patterns and that's that's one of our strengths and that's because our whole body and brain is is trained to to look for patterns all the time but if we talk about pairwise sequence alignment um like the number 13 how do you mean like the number 13 is that a movie you reference that i'm unaware of the number 13 I oh, know 23. I'm lost. I'm lost, Commando. Um, but if you want to do pairwise alignment, you mean 42? No, 42 is the the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Not not 23, and also not 13. Yeah, but we are the deciders in this case. So humans are very good at finding patterns and we want to transfer this knowledge that we have about when, when things are similar or when things are dissimilar to the computer to be able to more or less analyze millions and millions of these sequences. Um, and so if you think about just two sequences, right, and you want to do pairwise alignment, there are two fundamentally different ways of doing it. And so the first way is to do a global alignment. And so what the global alignment attempts is to align every residue and every sequence so to each other. And global alignment can be used when sequences are more or less equally long, right? So if, if, if we look at these, right, then uh, we would say, yes, this is something where you could use global alignment. And they, these sequences are, they are different in length, but they are not too different, right? And we can also see that, well, here it starts with a GT, and so that might match here at the beginning, and then we have a CT, which is this part here, right? So you would say that, well, there's a little AC insertion in the first sequence, which is not found in the second sequence, right? And then we have CTG, which is an exact match here, and then we have this part A, so there's another um, um, GA insertion. Right, so these two sequences are completely similar, except for the fact that this one has a G more at the beginning. It has an, uh, an, an uh, it has a CT. No, it has an AC insert and it has a GA insert. So there's only like three, you only have to do three modifications to come from this sequence to that sequence. Right, so three mut mutations more or less would be enough. Um, meaning two insertions and one kind of point deletion. To, to block out, right? So these sequences are more or less suitable for uh, for global alignment. So global alignment is, is when you have two sequences which are of relatively similar length, and what you are saying is, well, I have a protein sequence of 140 amino acids, I have another protein sequence which is 120 amino acids, and align these as best as you can. Um, then the other, the other possibility to do alignment is, of course, to local alignment, and local alignment describes the most similar regions within the sequences to be aligned. And so this is generally used when you have a very short sequence on the one hand and a very long sequence on the other hand. And so if you think about, um, I have a, an, an, a little RNA sequence that I found, and I have a genome sequence, so the genome sequence is billions and billions of letters long. And of course, I cannot start with this RNA and start at the beginning and just compare it to every everyone, right? That that would just take too much time. You would do billions and billions of comparisons before you would have actually looked for an exact match and then allowing for one or two mismatches would be even worse. And so you would do millions and millions of comparisons. And so global alignment is when sequences are equally long. Local alignment is when you are looking for a subsequence in a large sequence. And so in theory, hey, if we have S1 and S2, um, which is of course a little bit, um, they are of dissimilar length in a way, hey, but what a global alignment will do is it will try to match the whole string. And by matching the whole strings, it will start to insert gaps into S1 and S2 while a local alignment will match the optimal substring, so it will allow mismatches in the middle, um, but it will just, it will not directly align to the beginning or the end. And so when we do a global alignment, we, we put extra weight on stuff which is matching at the beginning and stuff which is matching at the end, and we more or less, have we, we, we don't penalize for gaps in the middle. Um, have while have here in local alignment, we will just ignore the terminals because we're looking for the local mac minimum have where we can fit S2 without having to modify S2 too much. 
Um, yeah, so in global alignment, we generally allow S2 to be kind of modified and chopped into pieces, while in local alignment, we just want to find the most optimal substring. Um, so where does it fit best? And if it fits there, so it, local alignment generally doesn't introduce gaps, while global alignment introduces gaps in the shorter sequence. Of course, there's many different ways of aligning, and um, in order to assess the quality of an alignment, we have to have a, a scoring function. So the, the most basic scoring function that you can come up with as, well, a simple human or simple bioinformatician is the, the most simple score, and that is just the number of matches that you have, right? So, and you, you express that as a percentage. And so here we have two sequences which are aligned to each other and in the first alignment um, are they the same yep and yeah yeah so why is this five out of seventy oh okay because here we have the uh, yeah here we are missing the uh, missing the last two and here we have the last with a with a mismatch um, but the 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 idea is, is that you align two sequences and hey of course we now decide which one is better hey is alignment one better than alignment two no because alignment two is the best alignment because here 11 out of 16 base pairs match uh, while in alignment one five out of 17 or five out of 16 depending if you count the last two deletions here i think these last two should not be here uh, and the first one here as well so had this would be five out of 15 and this would be 11 out of 15 base pairs matching right and this is the this is the idea behind just it's the basic scoring algorithm that you can come up with and, and of course this is this is useful, right? Because now we can decide which one of the alignments we would prefer. Yeah, but of course, we can do a lot of uh, we can we can do a lot better, right? So doing a lot better uh, means, for example, um, doing our scoring function that we had before, uh, but now we are going to add a gap penalty, right? So for introducing a gap, we want to uh, penalize for that, right? So um, have we, we do additive scoring with a linear gap penalty. That means that we, we look at all the similarities for position one and sim similarity two, right? And then we, we add for every gap that we open, we add a, a negative score. Right, so here we look at the similarity, so we, we go through each of the positions in S1 and S2, but when we introduce a gap, we actually penalize for that. And so we just say, well, if, if there's a match between two bases, we give a plus one. If there's a mismatch between two base pairs, we give a negative one. And if we introduce a gap, we just say negative one as well. And so that's just to kind of deal with the gaps. The question here is, is should you penalize gaps as much as, um, as mismatches? Right? Um, is it is it worse to have a gap or is it worse to have a mismatch? And of course, from biology, there are um, have from from the way that DNA works and that things mutate, and have we we have kind of an idea what good fitting parameters are, right? And um, have, this is just a way of extending the scoring function to include the possibility to kind of introduce gaps in one of the two sequences. You can actually do a little bit better and doing a little bit better is meaning that you now get instead of a linear gap penalty, right? For every gap that you have or for every missing base pair in one of the sequences you score minus one, you can say, well, opening a gap is expensive, but once you open the gap, it's relatively cheap to kind of um, extend the gap, right? And that comes from the biology idea is that um, if you have a deletion, hey, this deletion is generally bigger than like a couple of base pairs. So hey, if you, if there is really, if these, if this one sequence is actually originating from the other sequence, but it just has a deletion in there, hey, then of course you don't want to penalize it based on the size of the deletion hey, because biologically technical speaking or DNA technical speaking, it doesn't matter if a an, an deletion of five base pairs is introduced or a deletion of 10 base pairs is introduced. In both cases, you just have one deletion in the DNA, right? So what, what, the, the, uh, the, what the affine gap penalty means is that you have two different penalties. One is for opening a gap, which is generally high, and then you have another, which is the gap extension penalty. So when you extend the gap, you don't penalize as much as when you opened up the gap. Is that clear?
what the difference is between the, the linear gap penalty and um, so here we just look at the number of positions that we have where there is a gap and then we multiply that with minus one which is the same as for a mismatch and here we just say well no opening up the gap gives you for example a minus one but extending the gap only gives you like minus 0 0.05 all right I hope that that's clear so the aff affine gap penalty all right you have to realize that alignments can be done at DNA or on a protein level and or, right? So um, an exercise for you guys, um, here I have a little, uh, little example and um, I'm actually going to stop recording because we need to take a break as well. Um, let me see, can I actually uh, because if we take a break I do want to show you guys the uh, the, the GIFs, of course. Um, I will at least stop recording. So.